welcome to another episode of the Hefty Guitar Channel. Every once in a while, I'd like to segue into learning something else about the guitar aside from just the playing part. So this week, I want to talk about strats. My buddy and I, we went strat hunting this week because he was looking for a new professional strat. Um, I will include some of the video footage from my Instagram here, but I think I want to do a proper video on this topic because there's a lot of stuff um, that can be learned and I want to share some of what I know about it. So very quickly, a brief history of Fender. It was started by this guy Leo Fender who was an engineer, uh, not so much of a guitar player. He started building amps back in the 40s. His first electric guitar instrument uh, was the Telecaster. But it was not released as the Telecaster, it was released initially as the Broadcaster. However, they were sued by Gretsch, or give them a cease and desist, um, because Gretsch owned the rights to the name Broadcaster for their Broadcaster drums. Incidentally, Gretsch re-released their Broadcaster drums recently, as of like a couple of years ago. So you can check out this history over here. So what Fender did, they took out the name Broadcaster from the headstocks. And for a period, there was no decal on the headstock. So this period eventually came to be called the No-Caster. So eventually, Fender settled on the name Telecaster and that name stuck until present day. Then the issue about the Telecaster is that players started to complain, you know, it was sharp behind the back and was uh, punching into their ribs and they wanted a more angular edge over here. So Leo Fender listened to this feedback and he made some changes to the design and in, by 1954, he released the Stratocaster. So what we know about 50 Stratocasters are uh, generally they were made of Swamp Ash uh, and had sunburst finishes and had a maple neck and maple fingerboard. In 1959, 1960, they changed to a rosewood fingerboard and that's what 1960 Stratocasters um, mainly were known for, the rosewood fingerboards. And then 1965, we know that Fender sold the company to CBS due to uh, health reasons. So what happened, interestingly, 1965 was a hallmark year uh, for music history, music instrument history, because Fender sold to CBS, Gibson sold to Norlin, and Marshall Amplifier signed uh, the famous uh, distribution deal with Rose Morris. So this period be was sort of like the dole drums for all these three companies, uh, from which they eventually emerged stronger when they got out of their respective deals or bought over their company. When these companies were sold off in 1965, Legend has it is that the quality of US made instruments dropped and this created a vacuum and in come the Japanese guitar makers such as Tokai, Yamaha, eventually Aria Pro, um, Fernandez and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of these Japanese made instruments in the 70s and they produced some might argue better quality instruments than what was being produced in America at the time. There was also a small demand for I guess good American made instruments and therefore Companies, uh, American-based companies like Hamer, Schecter, and Dean Guitars uh, also I penetrated the market and started making guitars. Interestingly, in the 70s, in the late 70s specifically, Stratocasters were hot-rodded following a trend introduced by Eddie Van Halen by putting humbuckers into the strats, right? And eventually, the Super Strat was born. And this is quite interesting because this happened in a period where the company that actually made the Stratocaster weren't really doing so well. So this resulted in the proliferation of super strat making guitar companies such as Ibanez, Kramer. Kramer was probably the biggest uh, company in the 80s. Charvel and Jackson Guitars. So here's where our story starts. So fast forward to the early 80s, specifically 1985, Fender was not doing well uh, under the CBS era. They engaged this guy named uh, Bill Schultz, who eventually with a bunch of other former employees decided to buy out the company with the help of some investors and eventually they became Fender Music Instruments Corporation, FMIC, which is what we have today and thank God for that. One year later, in 1986, they released the Fender American Standard Stratocaster, which is sort of the modern variant of the Stratocaster guitar. So it had 22 frets, rosewood or maple fingerboard, and it had the modern tremolo. Fender also released the HM Strat, or the heavy metal Stratocaster. It wasn't really called the Stratocaster, it just said HM Strat, or the Strat on the headstock. It had 24 frets, 
it also had Floyd Rose and interestingly it also introduced the contoured heel similar to this one exactly the same as this one in that instrument by the late 80s all the super strat companies for instance Ibanez they had their uh, RG series they had their S series and the R series eventually became the Joe Satriani signature super strat shredding guitars were all the rage so Fender actually had to compete Fender also introduced their Talon electric guitar uh, as well as their Fender Prodigy which was supposed to be Fender's version of the Super Strat guitars. However, all of these other companies had an awesome and Dorsey list. For instance, Ibanez had Steve Vai, Joe Satriani and Paul Gilbert. Kramer had Eddie Van Halen and Richie Sambora of Dan Bon Jovi. So, Fender signed in 1989 Yngwie Malmsteen and the first uh, signature Fender was released. The Yngwie Malmsteen signature with the scallop fingerboard. This was followed very quickly with the Jeff Beck signature guitar as well as the Eric Clapton signature guitar. Interestingly, all three Fender and Dorsey's preferred noise cancelling pickups. With Yngwie Malmsteen choosing the DiMarzio HS3s at the time, eventually that being replaced by the YGM Furies, Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton were using the Lace Sensor Gold pickups. So interestingly, their signature models until today retained noiseless pickups, although today's versions use something different. So aside from the signature guitar models, Fender also released their top end range called the Fender Strat Plus and the Strat Plus Ultra. And these also featured a complement of lace sensor pickups. So this Strat Ultras are not to be confused with the modern current uh, Fender Strat Up Ultras. Those Strat Ultras back in the 90s used okay, the Ultras had a blue lace sensor in the neck, a silver lace sensor in the middle, and red, red dually humbucking lace sensor pickup in the bridge. The Strat Plus had only a single red lace sensor in the bridge. Another flagship range of the Fender USA was the Fender American Vintage series. So this is also not to be confused with the Fender American Vintage 2, which just came out recently. So the difference between the two, the modern range, the Plus and the Ultras, had a wider neck. As in all of the guitars in the 90s, everybody preferred a slightly wider neck, which is 1 and 11 16th. Whereas the Fender American Vintage had a more conventional neck, which was 1 and 5 8 inch, and had a rounder fingerboard, which was 7 and a half inches. Whereas the Fender Strat Plus and Ultras had a flatter radius similar to the American standards, also, the fretboard on the Ultras were ebony. Ebony was all the craze back in the 90s. So the original Fender Jeff Beck signature in the 90s had a HSS pickup complement of lace sensor goals with a gold gold dually in the bridge. It also had a switch over here where you press it, you could split the humbucking pickup to just a single coil. Later in the early 2000s, the Jeff Beck Strat changed from the lace sensor goals to the hot noiseless pickups. Similarly, the Eric Clapton signature also featured three gold lace sensors, but it also had a mid boost switch, which was in the second tone knob, as well as a TBX tone control. So the Fender Eric Clapton signature was a very interesting instrument because the idea behind the Clapton signature Strat was to be able to coax humbucking sounds from the Stratocaster. Everybody else had been putting humbuckers in the Stratocaster, but this guitar's approach was it tried to use the mid boost switch to change the tonal contour of a Stratocaster by making it fatter and hotter, similar to that of a humbucker. Some people like this sound, whereas some people find that it doesn't sound anything like a humbucker, maybe only in terms of output, but I think with every instrument, it has to go through a certain amp combination and pedal combination in order to achieve your sound, right? So it may work for some artists, whereas some others may not work through their amps. In the early 90s, Fender also had Floyd Rose mounted on a few of their guitars. That was the Floyd Rose Classic Strat, as well as the Richie Sambora Signature, the first model. So the first Richie Sambora Signature had the Floyd Rose. It also had a humbucking pickup in the bridge Supposedly the DiMarzio PF Pros. However, if you take a look at the DiMarzio website, the PF Pros uses slotted Allen keys as the pole pieces. However, every Richie Sambora Stratocaster uses 
the traditional slug and slotted screw as the pole pieces. So if anybody has any insight on this, please write in the comments and share with all of us. The Sembar Strat also incorporated for the first time the, the contoured heel borrowed from the HM Heavy Metal Strat. It also had a chamfered behind the lower horn area for upper fan access. And interestingly, it also included the Eric Clapton mid boost on the second toe knob. From what I read, the first versions of the uh, Fender Sambora Stratocaster also had 20 dB mid boost on the mid boost control. However, this was changed to a 12 dB mid boost because Richie was complaining that if you put 20 dB, it pushed a lot of low end, according to him, shit out of the amplifier. Also, the Sambora Strat had the infamous star inlays made of mother of, of pearl. However, those inlays don't seem to age well because every one that I find on Reverb, uh, the stars have turned to yellow. In any case, so in late 1998 or 1999, I can't really remember, the Sambora Strat was changed. It had its Floyd Rose replaced with a vintage tremolo, six screw tremolo. It changed the Texas Special neck and middle and the Path Pro humbucking pickup to three single coil, noiseless single coils, the hot noiseless. These pickups are, I believe, the same hot noiseless pickups on the Jeff Beck Stratocaster, but I believe they came out on the Sembora Strat first. The Sembora Strat also retained the mid boost, the 12 dB mid boost on the second tone knob, the contoured heel as well as the, con the chamfered rear lower horn. But the star inlays were also reduced in size to the smaller star inlays. To be fair, there were signature Strat models which uh, prefer to use standard traditional non-noise cancelling Strats like for instance the Bonnie Raid Strat at the time, the Robert Cray Strat and even the SRV Signature although uh, SRV had already passed on. In any case, the pickups that they used were the Texas Specials which were not harm cancelling. So whatever the case may be, when Leo Fender introduced the Stratocaster back in 1954, the design pretty much hasn't changed until present day. Small, small things like maybe the bridge design and maybe the contoured heel, right? maybe the addition of an additional fret on the 22nd fret, locking tuners, all of this may have changed, but the overall look and shape, even the, the jack socket still remains here, which is part of the, the what makes a Fender a Fender. So, this is testament to Leo Fender's, I guess, design. And I can only think of only two other products that can claim the continuity of the design since its inception. Number one was the Boss Pedal, and number two is probably the Marshall 1959 Super Lead Plexi. So that brings me to this guitar. When we were looking for strats, um, I recalled a video by Carl Verheyen, who was talking about how to identify a good strat from a bad strat and he was mentioning the B string. So he suggested holding the butt of the strat over here and plucking the B string. And he said that if you could feel the vibration over here, that means that was a good guitar. You can feel the vibrations from all of the other strings from the low E to the high E at this point. But I think perhaps what he meant was the B string frequencies weren't really translatable very well on Strat bodies. So if you happen to find one that you could feel the vibrations here because of the transfer of the, the, the vibration into the body, then that would be a good piece. I actually tried this on all my guitars. Interestingly, I found that, yes, my American Deluxe had that vibrational transfer. So did my another, Mex another guitar, which was um, my Roland Ready Stratocaster made in Mexico. However, my third Stratocaster, or rather my first Stratocaster, which uh, was uh, also a Mexican HSS Strat, it had a popular body, but just like what he said, when I plunked the B string, I didn't really feel the vibration over there. So this is something that I've always been using when I've been shopping for new guitars. How interestingly different woods and different guitars, for instance, like uh, if it was a mahogany, guitar with the Floyd Rose, you might find the vibrational transfer still being there, but maybe not as much as say on a Fender. I also find the guitars with a maple cap, because a maple is a harder wood, sometimes that transfer uh, is less, it doesn't mean that that particular Les Paul or what is not resonant, it's just that because of the design of that guitar, maybe that's not the application. That being said, if say for instance, if you plunk the B string on a Les Paul and by holding it over here and you can still feel the vibrations, 
then I suppose you can take it to the bank that it is probably a very resonant piece of wood for the body. So another thing I, I talked about uh, with my buddy when we were strat shopping was this concept of the three toe knobs or three knobs. We grew up in the 90s where all you needed was actually just one volume knob. We played with our toe knobs full. Sometimes we preferred guitars without the toe knob like the Nuno Washburn N4 and the Eddie Van Halen Music Man signature. However, I think this is also testament to Leo Fender's design. By adding ad an additional knob for tone, it gives you a lot of flexibility. So one of the things that we noticed with the American Professional 2 that we were auditioning, the second tone knob allowed you to actually bring in the neck pickup with the bridge pickup. So this was brought this originated probably from the Fender Custom Shop Half Blender Mod. Okay, basically what it does is that this tone knob was specifically dedicated to the neck pickup, but it only worked in positions one and two, which is the bridge pickup as well as the bridge and middle pickup. So what that does, the standard five positions give you the standard neck, neck and middle, middle, middle and bridge, and just the bridge. But in position one, by dialing in the neck pickup, you add the neck pickup together with the bridge pickup for your sort of like tele neck bridge combinations. And then in positions two, when you have your middle and bridge, by adding in your neck pickup, you get all three pickups. So instead of five positions, you get seven positions. So this is a very interesting, I guess, mod uh, that is standard on all American professional tools now. Why I like this mod is because a lot of Stratocaster players or a lot of guitarists who don't like the Stratocaster is because they find that the bridge pickup is just too trebly. So my my first guitar, how it came was it had a master volume over here, it had one tone knob for the neck pickup, it had one tone knob for the middle pickup. Not this guitar, my first Mexican. And there was no tone knob control for the bridge. So when you went to the bridge pickup, it was just too trebly, it was completely unusable. But later on, what I did was I assigned the middle tone pickup for the neck and middle and the second tone knob specifically for the bridge. So what that does is when I go to the bridge and if I were to dial down the knob, it fattens up the sound by taking off the treble, okay? So that made the bridge pickup usable again. So this is the second knob that I've been sharing with my friends and my students, right? How to make the bridge pickup on the Fender Telica Stratocaster usable again. So interestingly, the one on the American two, Professional 2, this pickup is a push-push and when it's engaged, you can dial in the neck pickup just like the half blender mod and when it's disengaged, you can use it as like how I just described as a tone knob just for the bridge. So it gives you two-in-one options and it really makes the Professional 2 very appealing. Now, let us talk about this guitar. This is a 2006 Fender American Deluxe. As you know, the current flagship range is the Fender American Ultra. Before that, it was the Elite, and then before that, it was Deluxe, Fender American Deluxe for a great number of years. The Deluxe is the noiseless offering of the top end flagship range for Fender. And I believe it's meant for more of the modern player. By using noiseless single coils, it sort of like darkens the top end a little bit, which a lot of us guitarists like, especially those of us who find the shimmer a little bit too much, while still retaining the Strat tone. So I think by and large, a company like Fender, if they stopped making the Stratocaster and start making something else, that would be a disaster. But that being said, I think Fender also cannot not make the Stratocaster because it is just their design. So sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing because if you're sort of like held hostage by your legacy and you can't do too much to change things and all that, then sometimes you're only allowed to work within limits. And I think they did it very well with this version, which is the 2006 Fender American Deluxe. This guitar had three noiseless Sumerian Cobalt pickups. Some people like them, some people hate them. I absolutely love them. They are thick and hot and fat. I'm not sure whether they're as hot as the current Ultras or Ultra 
hot noiseless but they they really work they were designed by i believe bill lawrence and the interesting thing is that this thing has the s1 switch okay every time when you have a switch it does add a lot of flexibility to your instrument with the switch disengage you get your standard five-way switch position but when you engage the switch essentially what you're getting is an additional five different tones okay so this is the bridge pickup um, i set my amp at uh, just the edge of breakup so what happens when i So what happens when I engage the S1 switch? It adds the middle pickup in series with the bridge pickup. Okay, so again, this is without it. With it. You can see here it sounds fatter. When I go to position four, neck and middle, with the switch engaged, it uses the same middle and bridge in series, but with an added capacitor. Compared to... Okay, so you can hear a slight difference in the treble. In the third position, with the switch engaged, it's all three pickups in series. So this is the fattest, most humbucking sound. So similarly, position two, neck and middle with capacitor and position one uh, in series without the capacitor. So why I want to talk about this is because this is very interesting. This uses the same concept as sort of like the Eric Clapton signature by introducing humbucking sounds without putting an actual humbucker into the guitar. So by using clever circuitry, putting stuff in series, it bumps up the output, right? Whether or not it achieves its objective is subjective to your ears. However, it is very useful to certain combinations of amps and pedals and how you, based on how you dial it, okay? So I think that this is Fender's ingenuity when it comes to, I guess, working with, in the limits of the Stratocaster and coming up with something new. Whether that is for you or not, again, it's subjective, it is own personal preference. I find that okay, this mod is no longer available in the current um, American Ultras. I think they've uh, changed it. I'm not sure what it is, but I know it's no longer 10 different possible combinations. Okay, so the other day we were also visiting City Music uh, in the sunny Singapore to check out this range of guitars uh, by Leo Fender called GNL. We were checking out, um, it was the, it wasn't a, the Legacy, which was the Stratocaster sort of like equivalent. It was the Skyhawk. The Skyhawk is also three single calls, although it was using the S500 pickups, the MFDs, but it also had a switch that does the same thing. So as I mentioned, with that switch disengaged, it gave you five pickup positions, just like the three single calls, but with that switch engaged, it gave you another five. So doubling the possible options you have to 10. So I thought that GNL was also very forward thinking. Um, and that being Fender's last company before he passed, the difference I feel between GNL and Fender is that GNL sort of like has free reign in sort of like trying to be creative. One of the things that GNL also does this was they assign this tone knob as your bass control and then this was your treble control. That gives you options of EQing your guitar however you please. Fender, however, still uses your tone knobs, right, as a parametric tone control by to dial in how much treble in your sound. It uses a different approach, but albeit it's still creative within the limits that it sets itself. So that's it for this week's um, video. I suppose it's not so much of a lesson. Um, if you like this and you want to see more of this non-playing content, please let us know. Please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the like button so that it will can help it can help us grow the channel. So this is Rizal Hafni from the Hafni Guitar Channel. I will see you in the next video.